Oh, some profound thinking about the simple act of making and the value of authenticity. Thank you, Ron. Um, now, Margaret Moore. Gee, what can you say about Margaret? <laughs> An independent curator, um, former curator of the visual arts uh, part of PF. Margaret's been responsible for many, many fine um, exhibitions and symposia around Perth, and she's attracted and hosted many significant artists to Western Australia. Um, Margaret has a tremendous background in, um, in the arts um, from Australian National University, uh, in this, uh, New South Wales, Sydney, where she curated um, as well and roles for the Art Gallery of New South Wales and National Gallery, etc., 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 Art Gallery of Western Australia. We could go on for ages. Margaret is an absolute icon of the art scene in Western Australia. We're incredibly privileged to have her here living in WA. She's done so much for some of you and for the arts in WA. She's a fantastic attribute and, and contributor to our culture. And I have great pleasure in uh, welcoming Margaret to the podium. Thank you. As Marcus just said, they'll be stopping me soon, so <laughs> taxidermy. Uh, I might actually just, I'm, I'm going to speak first and then go to images, but I might just, um, yeah, if we get out before, just to end there. That's alright, I just want to make sure I can uh, not delay that. I don't need to have it up yet. Thank you, Mari and everyone, for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Noongar Country uh, and pay our respects to custodians and elders past, present and into the future. Uh, I'm also a free agent tonight, actually, Ron. It is really quite liberating, isn't it? Because I, I left the festival earlier this year, um, so perhaps it allows me to reflect a little bit more tonight and also perhaps think um, largely big picture, which is probably, you know, um, rather than where Ron's coming from, which is very deep within and very much about the making and the artist and the mark making. I suppose mine's still related to that, but perhaps thinking a bit bigger picture and towards the future. I'm going to read um, and talk to some paper notes that I've made, um, and then I'm going to pitch to a handful of images at the end to sort of leave you with a few inspirations, but perhaps also, you know, I hope to sort of raise a few conversation starters as I go. Uh, as is often the case when you're invited to participate in a panel like this, um, you commit to a title, or you have to commit to a title, perhaps before really doing the thinking or the testing of that thinking. I did quite quickly settle on the term, uh, you know, art in the city or visual cultural maelstrom. Maelstrom might be slightly harsh, but having sort of tested it, I think I was pretty accurate. Uh, I think your instincts and your subliminal assessment is often the most reliable. If we don't have a confusion of visual culture at the moment, we certainly have a cacophony. Even a cursory scan of the Perth CBD elicits collisions of style, genre, imagery and expression. A few examples just to get us thinking. On St George's Terrace, we have kangaroos at both ends of the spectrum. Um, Laser Cut Steel by Anne Neal at one end from 1996, and the Verisimilitude Bronzes from 1998 at the other end. We have monuments to past premiers and historical figures, and we do have sculptural art commissioned along the way. I think written in 1967, Marcus and Christian, maybe. I don't know, a few years back, St George's Cathedral? 2010. 2010. Okay. And there are other works, of course, but just they're, they're big notable works, Charles Perry outside of the QB2 building. Throughout the CBD, we now have an array of murals and wall painting. It's proliferated and perhaps most substantially changed the face of Perth in recent years. There is residual street art on quite dominant scale from the form public initiatives. This is by nature mostly fairly figurative or narrative representation. And I was thinking before tonight that there's some irony in this for me that 
with that in the CBD, um, you know, in Perth, which is a, a wealthy resources tourism destination, we've sort of created this grit and grunge through um, street art, and I'm not being judgmental, just uh, observational. And in Fremantle, which is the you know city working port town, uh, we've created more sort of cool conceptual um, concrete art, you know, painted murals throughout the city. So that that in itself is fascinating to me. Um, that's not a judgment, just an observation. Forest Place, and I have to say this at the moment because I actually came in on the weekend to have another look, <laughs> thinking, of don't really, but Forest Place to me at the moment is a bit of a travesty. I've said it. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a judgment. Um, but, you know, I see, you know, the, the Yepa Heim that was commissioned, um, Labyrinth Rooms, the, the water pavilion. Um, the James Angus that was commissioned by a partnership with the city and the state. Um, there are other uh, public artworks throughout there on the ground surface. You would be hard pressed to find them at the moment. And I think this is what um, I think frustrates many perhaps, is that you know, with this investment and commitment to very major contemporary pieces, and then they're sort of um, completely submerged by temporary events, or encroaching fixtures that just keep added in to these squares. And, and I think we've all had experiences in other cities, particularly perhaps out of Australia, where you have this big central public square and it may only house one beautiful work. Um, I thought that was perhaps what Perth was attempting with its commissions in Forest Place, but I, I went in on the weekend and you couldn't even see the sculptures hardly because of all the the temporary stalls and activity and the stage and so forth. So I am a bit critical of that. Um, if you transit out of Forest Place across the pedestrian bridge to the Perth Cultural Centre, that too can be a bit visually fraught. And I'll put it out there again. I, see, I'll tell you I'm a free agent. Um, the plastic kite, the plastic pink kite at the entrance out of the railway station toward the art gallery, I find utterly bothersome. Now, I'm not going to be sarcastic, but it, it, it just bothers me. It really physically, viscerally bothers me. And I suppose what, what I find in the cultural centre now is, you know, you'll have the plastic cart and then adjacent to that you have a concrete wall art, I think. I think it is from the city of Perth. Um, there's the community garden, there's signage coming out your ears. And then suddenly there are a couple of historical artworks. There's the Clement Mead Moore and the Gerhard Marx. But, you know, again, it's a cacophony of, of difference. I'm not, I think, you know, there's no question that the energy that's been brought to the cultural centre is extraordinary. I have great admiration for the people that have put in huge effort. But, you know, the wayfinding, the articulation, the art, the signage, the community, it's just layer upon layer upon layer. And I guess as a bit of a purist visual arts person, I, I find it frustrating. So that's my just sort of quick slice of the CBD. If you move into the suburban councils, there is more and more of the same. And I suppose tonight for our discussion, this kaleidoscopic outcome, I think might be understandable in an evolution of a growing city. And it may in fact be quite acceptable and for some people will really respond to it and love it. And I do genuinely believe, because I've seen a lot of people and work with a lot of people in the area, I do genuinely believe that the delivery of public art in Perth is bathed in good intentions. But I suppose for me, having had the chance to reflect for tonight, I do think the outcome is becoming increasingly piecemeal. So I guess that's my quick introduction, my reflections this evening. <laughs> now I'll be quick, I'll be quick, don't worry. But my reflections this evening will focus a little bit on unpacking why we're piecemeal, um, and of course that can be contested. Um, perhaps what are the systemic issues? And for me, the big thing I'd, I'd like to reflect on is what could shift that model, or what could take us into a, a future direction. A definition of public art is always going to be contested, as, of course. Um, I've got a few little thoughts from others on this just to put us into context and I'm sure this will be relevant to others following me tonight. Uh, in 2009, um, in a commentary in Forbes on an article, Why We Love and Need Public Art, there were several definitions that were quoted following the truism that public art is a shadowy, nebulous thing. And I think we'd all concur with that. 
and actually that's quite a poetic way of putting it, I think. Then from a variety of sources, there were definitions such as, in inverted commas, and this was an article that came out of New York, of course, um, it is government-sponsored or funded artwork created by or with professional artists and legally cited in publicly accessible venues. A spokesperson from the agency Forecast Public Artworks referred to it as the four M's, murals, monuments, memorials, and mimes. In a recent, and that, that's okay, I think they mean sort of performative work as well. Um, in a recent article in a conversation by Simon Van Jury, and I mean Simon may be here actually, I don't know, um, in, a, in an article in the conversation called Art Can Be Everywhere, Public Art in Western Australia, it was curious to me that in high praise of Perth International Arts Festival, Form and Fringe World, he wrote, uh, PF has delivered captivating performances, ephemeral um, and installation works by leading international artists such as Place, Place de Lange and by the Studio de Cirque and Walking with the Giants by Royal Deluxe. And to me, and I'm obviously I'm a bit invested in this, having been the visual arts program person there, but to me neither of these are actually public art. They are street theatre on an epic scale. Um, I'm sort of unequivocally talking tonight about visual artists and, and visual art, and for me that's absolutely central to public art. I'm driven by the primacy of visual arts culture in the public realm, and I guess art of ideas driven by highly competent visual arts, and artists who are engaged with place, as Ron was talking about. So I've identified um, kind of nine issues, and I'm, or nine, actually they're not even issues, just topics, thoughts, reflections. I said I was doing reflections. And there's nine of them um, that I hope are kind of conversation starters, really, and they're in no particular order. First one is multiple voices versus the multiplier effect. And by this I mean, you know, that I think the democracy of public space means it is important to allow for multiple voices and idioms. I think that's a given. You know, what is, is something special to me is something not so special to another. We all have um, our own sort of visual lexicon. But the multiplication effect or the multiplier effect holds far less appeal for me. That is, the repeating of ideas um, over a nausea, I suppose, because it doesn't necessarily encourage new ideas or creative initiative. The repetition of models or projects can therefore affect the funding distribution and more importantly to me, limit the scope of fresh creativity. And I will call a couple of examples here. Uh, I mean, I think that the whole public mural thing that Form has done is absolutely amazing, but I think that has been done. I think, you know, the painting of silos, extraordinary in the regions, but, you know, we don't, I don't think we need to keep doing that. Um, Laneway is the same, and I know, you know, there's the pending cow parade, and I, you know, it frustrates me actually because that cow parade was in Margaret River in 2010. Um, and for me, somehow, it contextually is much more appropriate to Margaret River region and the dairy farmers and so forth and the wine growers than it is perhaps uh, as a parade in Perth City. And I sort of think the money that goes toward that could so much better be spent on, on kind of initiating a new project or a new idea. It's, and again, I know it's judgmental, but we're here to discuss it. Um, my next point is, is filling space with art instead of creating or seeking space for art. And perhaps um, Beth might have a bit more to say about this. <laughs> but, you know, the, the perils of activation and placemaking has become almost a default strategy in funding accountability, audience development and other key indicators. So much activation is described in the name of art but actually it's minus the artists. It's so often made by so many others except the visual artists. My third point is numerous agencies um, have a vested interest in visual arts in the public space and whilst that's to be applauded, it does seem to create one of our challenges. There seems to me far greater room for collaboration to the greater good. I mean, I know we have um, you know, a Centre for Art scheme, which I have to say I think has flourished and has proven to produce some extraordinary work. Um, there's the City of Perth, there's the layers of government or levels of government, the state, the local councils, 
there's the MRA, there's the arts institutions themselves, there's the festivals. And so many of those agencies are delivering public art in some form. And I wonder if perhaps with so many, we couldn't perhaps work a little bit more collaboratively, but perhaps that's a bit idealistic. I've also mentioned boundaries, and this was something that struck me from my experience at the festival. And I know that it's a contentious issue, because the whole thing about um, dispensing with local councils and creating the greater city of Perth, but I, I did see real evidence of how that can impede and impact, especially on funding, but also on the possibility of projects. There were times when I was working with a certain artist and an idea and really want to locate it somewhere and because of funding channels, it, you know, it was going to be outside the CBD or it was going to be in a region that didn't give money and you, know, and you still think we're talking about two kilometres here and we're talking about you know, major public projects. So I, I do get a bit frustrated by boundaries and how territorial and how sort of divisive it can be when you're actually all trying to achieve something major. Uh, my fifth point is artist applicability to public art. And I think not every artist a public artist makes. I think the quality of ideas and initial artist objective can lose its expression under the rigour of codes and the applications of engineering that re are required for public realm. It certainly requires visionary strength and adaptability skills from the artists involved. And I see it time and time again that some artists absolutely fly with that and just do remarkable work and I could cite some that I know who have grown so much in the last 20 years. And there are others where that creative essence gets completely compromised and lost. So I think it's, it's just important that whilst it can be an attractive opportunity or it can be a means of finance, it does not suit every artist. I think this is a big one though. I think artists can and do have great ideas. And it seems to me stating the obvious, but you know, this can be so underestimated and is so often should be the lead premise when contemplating public art. And I will show some images, and some of you will be well aware of this project that's just been in Sydney with the Keldor Art Project, so I'll, I'll talk to it when I come to it. But you know, it even went out with its submission seeking, um, seeking submissions from artists, and it said, Your very big idea. You know, it wasn't about we want to work to fit in, you know, this area or to engage this audience or to do that. It was we want your big idea. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. I'm always overwhelmed with the, the, the concepts and the imagination of artists. They take us to places we would never imagine going. I think art can also reinvent the audience. All positives about good public art are its ability to change a perspective on space or place inspire response, and heighten audience imagination, engagement, etc. And I think we must never underestimate the audience appetite for visual arts experiences. And again, I had such personal experience of this, um, you know, with many projects that we did throughout the festival, but, you know, the scattered light work by Jim Campbell in Kings Park was a huge eye-opener for me. You know, there was 180,000 people experienced it. I do have an image later to remind you. And there were families turning up, people picnicking, people rocking up in cars at night with children in pyjamas, just to sort of be a part of it and to experience it. And they may not know, and they were experiencing, you know, one of the leading multimedia artists out of San Francisco, but they had this fabulous engagement with something in it, you know, crowded Instagram and so on. Um, Shea Jean Wah's work, Rose Nolan's work down St George's Terrace, Daniel Von Sturmer on the, the building at the end of St George's Terrace. Inside Australia by Anthony Gormley. And I have to say, Marcus, your rainbow, you know, <laughs> has just created sort of, you know, that potential for being a destination experience or, or something where people may not quite know what they're, ex they're experiencing, but they're responding very favourably. I will, at this point, just very quickly, because um, someone put these in much better words than I would, um, and it, it will... I still have my glasses on, but I've actually been saying everything I meant. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there was a, a paragraph here at the beginning of the article that I referred to before, and um, it, it does date because it refers to blackberries and iPods, neither of which are that prolific anymore. But it was in 2009, but for me, this is sort of, you know, it just 
It reminds you when you do have an engagement with an extraordinary visual arts experience, this is the sort of uh, energy you can get. And, and it's interesting when we think about Perth. It said, New Yorkers are a disaffected bunch. In public, they can seem blind to their surroundings, always fiddling with a Blackberry or iPod. I did say it was 2009. And at all costs, avoiding eye contact. Yet Lyon Central Park, with miles of orange gates, and that was Christophe and Jean-Claude, or install some temporary man-made waterfalls on the East River, and these urban dwellers shed their recalcitrance and become positively giddy. Passerby, look and point and smile, and even, wait, is that a stranger actually asking me for my opinion? And I thought, you know, we've all had that moment, perhaps, uh, perhaps in Perth, perhaps when we've been travelling, where we've just had this extraordinary experience with an artwork, and it's someone's imagination, it's someone's vision, it's someone who was able to deliver something remarkable. I'm up to number seven. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm up to number eight. Um, and this will sound a bit dramatic, but I've actually thought about this a bit. Perhaps we have a lack of visual arts cultural leadership and vision for the benefit and totality of Perth. And I mean that in the sense that we now have kind of a lot of agencies who are really dedicated to um, lobbying power to try and get better recognition for culture and arts throughout the state, and I think they are to be absolutely applauded. Perhaps within that, though, we don't seem to have the strength of a visual arts voice. Um, perhaps there's political fear of grandeur or boldness in art. Perhaps there's fear of failure driving decision-making. No doubt there's, there's suffering under funding, but, um, but with that sort of slightly thin visual arts cultural leadership, I think we haven't had that lead by example, um, and that seems sort of confounded and endemic to me at the moment. We get the same old outcomes. Number nine is perhaps where I go to my images in a moment, the future. I guess I'm trying to think how could we in Perth break the cycle and elevate the sophistication of the visual arts to increase the ambition. And I'm it sounds like a sort of simplistic way and it sounds like a bold move all in one. But to really take a longitudinal view in elevating the scale and function of the visual arts offered in the public realm, I'd love to see the, the possibility of aiming for one major ephemeral project every two or three or five years even that became a sort of destination experience. It would have to determine a singular host site and we'd have to determine the partners. We develop a budget of magnitude that wouldn't be worth doing unless it wasn't. And in part, some of that could be by suspending some of those smaller expenditures that seem to go on um, regularly. Perhaps it's by a consortium and not just government. We determine a curated strate a strategic program of ephemeral public art commissions, create that rolling program of artists' invitations or, or commissions, whatever, and I had this sort of fluttering thought, you know, perhaps um, with all respect to the art that's there now, but, you know, we could have had the key commission, the Elizabeth Key Commission that happens every five years or three years. Perhaps there's the Perth Project that's located in Kings Park or whatever. And I am tonight sort of unashamedly committed to high-end art and ideas because the rest has many champions and it tends to take care of itself. Vision and support for the ambitious and the unequivocally contemporary seems harder to come by. Now, I'll leave it at that and, and throw to 20 images, if I can get them up. But I really, and I, and I will say at the outset, some of these have had extraordinarily huge budgets. I mean, I know that it's not reality for, for Perth today, but I think unless you sort of and, you know, think large, um, perhaps we don't move forward. Firstly, I will, and I just have to, but I can control it, can't I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, now, this, this is the project I mentioned, the Calder Art Project. Some of you may have seen it if you've been in Sydney in the last few weeks. It's literally just been completed. By Jonathan Jones, who's a Wiradjuri Kamalori man. Um, and the project is called Skin and Bones. 
This was his very big idea, and this has just been realised. Now, I also know Calder is a private art foundation, but they also work with the Royal Botanic Gardens and the state government, the Art Group New South Wales, and many others to deliver it. Um, some of you would know, but what he effectively did, uh, I'll just give you, I'm not sure quite what you're seeing there. Oh, you're still seeing, okay. So what he decided to do was to, um, he, d he researched and discovered that there was this international exhibition palace that was created on this site in Sydney and it burnt down in 1882 and inside it, it held a huge number of Aboriginal artefacts and it was a rather sort of colonial thing where they're about to do this massive exhibition, um, the British, you know, colony of how they sort of colonised, you know, this was the grand exhibition of, of you know, their holdings and, and of course most of it was Aboriginal holdings. And Jonathan decided to do uh, this kind of reconstruction on the ground, the footprint of that palace. And because it had burnt down, he decided to use a ceramic or gypsum and he created, I don't know, 20,000, maybe more, of these kind of shield forms that, there were four different shield forms that came from the artefacts. This is Jonathan, and it just gives you an idea of um, the scale of each shield. And laid them out um, on the ground and it stayed there for three or four weeks. It had huge coverage, they, did, they activated the art with a whole range of, you know, um, indigenous cultural uh, performances, language discussions, talks. Um, it just it became an event, but it was led by a visual arts idea. Now for something completely different, but the idea of a, um, a you know, a more permanent site that keeps getting activated. And I did say we're talking, you know, huge budgets, but the Versailles Palace outside of Paris, since 2013, has commissioned a major artist uh, each year to take over the grounds and in some parts some of the, the palaces to do a massive project. Now, um, I'm just going to go through three images quite quickly because you'll see how this is only one element of the project. They do, you know, Oliver Ellison did his waterfall there that he'd done in New York some time before. But he also did this whole other range of projects throughout the gardens. But I'm just showing you that particular image because then you see that Anish Kapoor did that in the same site as well as a whole range of other projects. It was very controversial, it was vandalised, so that can happen outside of Perth as well. Um, and, <laughs> and, but it does, you know, but I think you have to keep doing to actually um, uh, win people over in some ways. Uh, and then the first one, in fact, I, I didn't have them in order, but it was by Lee Yufan, the Korean artist. But you can just see that that's one example of a particular site, obviously investing a huge fund, but having an artist sort of interpret their experience of you know, the whole history of Marie Antoinette and Versailles and so forth, and the physical relationship of those grounds and the gardens and so forth. That's Versailles. You would, many of you know about the fourth plinth in London, where you know, each year they invite an artist to do the, the, uh, the work on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, which um, had never been finished because they didn't have funds in history. And this happens to be Katharina Frisch's work from Germany, but I know David Shrigley's just done the hand up at the moment. So, you know, there's huge anticipation about that project. People go to see what it is each year. Um, and then I'm going to take you to the Madison Square Park Conservancy in New York because, and I, because of a personal reason, but um, again, it's an example of where they put a, again, huge project, but they put it up for six months of the year. In this instance, I might have jumped one there, but no, no, I did. Um, uh, this is Teresita Fernandez, um, an artist out of Brooklyn. You can see she's done this sort of mirrored canopy um, with dappled light running throughout the park, and we're talking, you know, hundreds of metres of it. There's about six different components, and I showed you this image in a different time of the year, different time of the day, different climatic conditions. Um, that again has been doing projects now for quite a few years where they invite uh, an artist, um, give them the budget and they do something for six months. 
The reason I showed it was because Scattered Light, which some of you would remember up in Kings Park, was first commissioned by Madison Square Park Conservancy. And we were the beneficiaries of that, really, because what he created was this solid state sculpture that could, in fact, be relocated. And, you know, we were thrilled to be able to do that in Perth. Um, some of you would remember, because that image was in New York, and this image was taken uh, during the festival. There are other quieter projects. I've just got a couple of images here. This was a dose of hard work from um, uh, 2015, I think. Um, and again, I'm showing it because it was a much quieter experience, probably less exposed. It was on the South Perth foreshore. But this had been originally commissioned by the Seitushi Triennial in the Sato Islands of Japan. And again, it was a work that was um, relocatable and in fact very open to different readings. He'd been very inspired by the fishing villages. And you'll see, you know, it's all made with these nets covered in gold and silver figures called Network. It was very much about the strength in numbers and so forth, but also, and, and the history of net making and net repairing and so on. But of course, at, a, at the edge of the water in the time we were talking about refugee crisis, it sort of took on another emotional tone when you talk about the power of um, people and that idea also of images of refugees behind sort of exactly these kind of um, wires. Now, um, I want to just quickly shoot these images in because I suppose what I was thinking is you don't always have to spend a lot of money to get impact as well. And these, of course, are ephemeral projects. You can tell that's what I'm pitching tonight. But um, at West Farmer's House, uh, this was Reko Rini, from, um, an indigenous man from Melbourne. Some of you would have seen that. Um, Consuelo was given the same. And this year we did a project um, with, with West Farmers with Barty Kerr, the Indian artist that I work with. And then I've just got two more images um, that I think perhaps was inspired, or I was inspired to show them perhaps because Marcus Rainbow. Um, but this is actually Ugo Rondononi, um, a Swiss Italian artist who lives in America. And this has literally just been opened as well, if I can use that term. Um, he had originally done something, been invited by the Public Art Fund in New York, and did this project of taking sort of this sculptural nature into the fabric of urban fabric of New York. And then this most recent project was done by the Nevada State Museum, so an art museum, uh, decided to commission him to do this sort of very artificial um, fabricated project in the desert, you know, completely surrounded by, um, by this vast desert. And so he chose to do this sort of Dago Pluro uh, mountains, magic mountains. This is my last image, I think. Gives you a sense of the scale of them. Um, and they'll be there for two years. So I think I'll leave it on that bright, luminous note. Um, and just, I suppose, reiterate that I think artists have to lead the way. And they need all the support they can get to be as ambitious as they should be, public or no public.